for science, technology and the arts. And we are dedicated to understanding, stimulating and increasing the amount of innovation that happens uh, across science, technology and the arts in the UK. I'm very, very pleased this afternoon to introduce uh, two brilliant speakers. Um, they don't like long introductions, so I promise you I, I won't give them a long introduction. Um, James Boyle teaches law at Duke University. Uh, Jennifer Jenkins is director for the Centre of the Study of the Public Domain, and more importantly, she's um, co-author of this, which she's going to be talking about. Um, and you're in for a real treat. They're going to be talking about the um, fantasy, or is it reality, of uh, clearance. So uh, sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks to Nesta also for, uh, for arranging uh, this and for helping to make it possible. Um, they do really interesting work, um, and I'm, I'm very impressed by it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the painful reality which any of the filmmakers in the room have had, probably had to deal with, which is the process of rights clearance, um, and in particular, the effect of law on, on creativity, particularly in documentary film, but really all types of creativity. Um, but before we do that, a little bit of a broader stage. Um, we, are both, uh, we both work at the Center for the Study of the Public Domain at Duke uh, Law School. And the public domain is the material that isn't covered by intellectual property rights, isn't covered by copyright or patent or trademark, the material that you're free to use without permission or fee. <coughs> The entire structure of our culture, our science, our art, our economy depends on the balance between the stuff that is protected, that is covered by rights, and the stuff that is free. If you're a filmmaker, you need rights to protect you, to allow you to control the creative expression that you put out, to allow you, hopefully, to get paid. Uh, for uh, screening it, to get somebody who's going to distribute it, who in turn is going to use those rights to say, if you pay me, I'm going to do this, to deal with the entire chain of distribution, and also to exercise the kinds of artistic control that you want to do. But at the same time, you need raw material. If everything in the world was covered by copyright so that it was illegal for you to take a single picture, then obviously filmmaking would be impossible. If every formula, every gene was owned, then science would be impossible. It's the mixture of freedom and ownership that together produces creativity, not one or the other. Unfortunately, that fact has got lost in recent years. Our center studies the balance between openness and control in every area of art and science. My colleague Jennifer uh, directs our arts project, which focuses specifically on the arts. And this is the end of a two-year um, research project on documentary film, which had a number of scholarly outputs and also the comic book, which we'll, we'll mention, because we found for some very bizarre reason documentary filmmakers weren't particularly interested in reading law review articles. So if we wanted to explain the law to them, uh, we were going to have to find some more accessible uh, way of doing so. Um, so I want to set the frame a little bit um, before we begin by talking about what's changed over the last 20 and 30 years. From our point of view, there have been changes in a linked series of things, technology, law, and business practices um, in documentary film and indeed in film generally, that have actually made it much harder for filmmakers to create and for documentary filmmakers to document and comment on our shared culture. It may not seem like it to you, but copyright and intellectual property law has a point. It's supposed to encourage creativity. When it isn't encouraging creativity, when it's making creativity hard or impossible, it's not working and needs to be changed. It either needs to be changed through legislative reform, through collective action of filmmakers by setting up best practices agreements, by changes in the way that insurance is carried out by changes in distribution methods, but it needs to be changed because the goal is not for the legal system just to exist and to hum nicely along by itself. It's for us actually to encourage more innovation, more creativity, more culture. 
So one thing that's changed, as, you'll, we'll dic uh, as we'll describe here, is that increasingly we have um, fallen into a permissions culture where it is assumed that every use of a piece of cultural material produced by another person requires both permission and often fee. This is, of course, not the way that culture has historically been made. You don't imagine Dizzy Gillespie saying, actually, how much for a eight bars of My Funny Valentine before I begin this solo. You don't imagine Charlie Parker saying, you know, I want to use the chords to the rhythm changes. Do I have to pay Gershwin's estate? Because those things are ridiculous. You don't imagine someone in blues or uh, rock and roll saying, oh, I'm going to pay for every chord sequence that I use because obviously someone must own it. You don't imagine our culture of jokes and language being something that is owned like stock certificates and parceled out with permission and fee at every stage. Yet that's what we're doing uh, to a lot of our culture. Another thing that has changed, we'll describe both uh, the legal and the, tech and the uh, business changes. Another thing that changed, though, is the technology. One of the great ironies that we study at our center is that right as the barriers to creation are coming down, legal barriers are rising in their place. So, to give you a sense of what's happening, we're going to start with some concrete examples of the kinds of things that documentary filmmakers are being asked for permission to use. And then we're going to tell you, is this really the law? Is this actually, with these claims that are made on filmmakers, is this really the law? I should say, we're versed primarily in US law, and we'll be talking about the law of fair use. But UK copyright law, which of course would govern those of you who are making films in the UK, has similar provisions called fair dealing, and we'll mention those briefly, although we don't purport to be British lawyers or to, to, to be experts in them. Um, it's also the case that it's worthwhile knowing about this stuff because a lot of what we're talking about is a global phenomenon. So that even if you understand, let's say, the law in your particular country, your work is going to go onto a global stage. And sadly, a lot of what you'll find out there is not the, the rules of any particular legal system, but a set of business practices that have grown up under the assumption that every use of any copyrighted material of any kind requires both permission and fee. And as we'll tell you, that's not the law and never has been. So let's start with some examples. Some examples. The first clip I'm going to play is from a film called Mad Hot Ballroom. How many people have seen that? Body by Amy Sewell. It's a wonderful film about New York City school children, 11-year-olds um, in a ballroom dancing competition. This is one of the 11-year-olds in the ballroom dancing competition walking around with his mother. And her phone happens to go off, and it's the Rocky theme song. And the filmmakers thought, wow, this is great. You know, This shows something about relationships between mothers and their sons, the cell phone culture. And isn't it wonderful that in this Italian neighborhood that this Italian woman has Rocky on her cell phone? Uh, so they got to the rights clearance stage of the film, and EMI, which owns rights to the Rocky song, said, oh, that's great. Um, you need to pay us $10,000. <laughs> for the six second ringtone that went off in the, in the scene by accident. And she said, $10,000? Well, that's very expensive. Um, you know, we can barely afford that. So she managed at this point to bargain them down to the bargain basement price of $2,500, which they actually paid to keep the scene in the movie because they thought it was so important and she, she thought it was so significant. <laughs> so you might say, um, is this actually covered by copyright? As James mentioned, as we'll talk um, about in the future, does the law actually require clearances for six seconds of a ringtone that goes off in the background of a documentary? As we'll discuss, as a legal matter, the answer is no. This is an example of the clearance culture or permissions culture that we're going to talk about. And you might say, you know, big deal, it's just a ringtone, it can come out, they can dub it over with something. But when a documentarian's job is to capture reality, and this copyrighted ringtone is part of reality, if filmmakers have to pay for all of these kinds of things, it really skews the process of documentary filmmaking. As Amy Sewell, the filmmaker, said um, at, a, at another conference when she was talking about this movie, if filmmakers have to worry about these kinds of things, documentaries cease to be documentaries. Uh, there are a lot of examples. These are, these, these are extreme examples, but there are other examples. Perhaps some of you have experienced these, uh, of the same kind of phenomenon. I'm going to play you another clip um, from the movie Seeing Faster by John Else. Has anyone seen this one? It's about the stagehands 
all about the stagehands in the background of uh, Wagner's very, very long ring cycle. His ring cycle opera goes on for 20 hours, four nights. I sat through it. It's about the stagehands in the background during the 20 hours of the ring cycle, and it's really a terrific, uh, it's a terrific documentary. And in the clip that you just saw, the stagehands are playing chess backstage, waiting for the time to pass, and you saw the television in the corner. What was actually on that television was a four and a half second clip from The Simpsons. That wasn't what was actually on the television that you saw. Um, and else, he was trying to play, play by the book. He got to the rights clearance phase of his project. And first, he talked to Matt Groening. He said, fine, of course. You, know, you don't have to pay me for that. It's terrific. Keep that in there. Then he talked to Gracie Films. And they said, it's fine. You, know, you don't have to pay us. This is fair use. It's OK. Uh, then, just to be extra careful, he talked to the people at Fox. And he found out two things. One, Matt Groening and Gracie Films do not own the copyright to The Simpsons. It's Fox. And two, they asked him to pay $10,000, the magic number. Apparently, 10000 is quite common, nice round number, for the four and a half second of clip of The Simpsons in the background. And in this case, instead of bargaining them down like, like Amy Sewell did to the bargain basement price of something like $2,500, um, he was at the end of the project. He was tired, and he just didn't have the money to pay for it. So in this instance, he actually had to digitally edit out the Simpsons clip and replace it with footage from one of his own films about Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. And so it actually works very well. You have Ride of the Valkyries blaring in the background. You have things exploding on the television. The only thing is that's not what was actually playing in the scene. So to quote Amy Sewell again, you know, if filmmakers have to worry about these things, or if they actually have to fictionalize the reality in their documentaries, do documentaries cease to be documentaries? It's almost impossible to make a documentary without using cultural artifacts, without using copyrighted material, music, photographs, in some kind of way. So another example that struck us as we were um, doing our research for the comic book was the documentary Eyes on the Prize. Um, how many of you have seen that? It's, it's long. Wonderful. Um, Eyes on the Prize is one of the most important records of the civil rights movement. And in order to tell this history, it uses the music of the time. They procured licenses for all of the music, uh, whether or not the clips were fair use. And unfortunately, because of their budgeting constraints, the licenses were only for short periods of time, five years or 10 years. So um, after the licenses expired, Eyes on the Prize was actually out of circulation because the licenses for the music had expired. And so, you know, your children, my school class, we want to show them Eyes on the Prize. If you went on Amazon, you tried to find it. It was out of circulation. It wasn't there. And so this was an instance where you think, this record of the civil rights movement is out of circulation because of copyright law? Is this how copyright's supposed to function? Again, copyright's supposed to encourage creativity, but it's also supposed to make sure we have these important records of culture out there. So um, these, these are only three of the examples that really struck us as important and prompted us to, to write this comic book. And we're going to move on. So I, I just want to stress what Jennifer was just saying. Um, one of the things we have to care about if we care about culture is we have to care about culture being available. Right? It's not enough that it get made or seen the first time. It has to be kept for future generations. Um, if you think of an archive, what you, when you look at an archive, you think of its physical reality. Because I've gone through the bizarre process of mind alteration that's called legal e education, I see something different. I see a set of landmines. Because if you look at that archive, what you will find is, in the case of film, particularly film made before 1940, that in the majority of that film, their so-called orphan works, we don't know who owns the rights to those. But because copyright has been extended and extended, they can't be shown. And remember, because we don't know, we can't ask the person who actually could say yes, or even pay them if we wanted to. That material is, in the practice of almost every repository anywhere in the world, only available to scholars, not to the public, not to be digitized, not to be put on the internet, even though the, it's been long since been removed from commercial distribution. Copyright's fulfilled its function, got it out there. It's just sitting there moldering. But then you add a second set of works, works where the, you might know who made it. You might know the, who made Eyes on the Prize. But it turns out that inside Eyes on the Prize are thousands of little permissions, licensing fees that have been paid for five years or 10 years. And since you're rational when you buy your licensing fees, and they're very expensive, you're not going to buy perpetual ones. 
you know, let's see if it does well. I'll buy two years, I'll buy three years. That's great, but what that means is that work then becomes off limits. So this law, which is supposed to encourage the production and distribution of our culture, is actually snapping shut on that culture and basically keeping it out of circulation. So um, the, um, the other thing that I was going to focus on was the effect of this on fictional works, not just on documentary film. So um, there's a, a lovely example shown here. Um, Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys. How many of you remember the Monty Python animations? There surely we're on for stronger ground. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, so Gilliam made those, those animations, you know, the foot coming down, the, you know, all the things at the beginning of Monty Python. In not a single uh, instance of those did he ask permission. He just took. Now, some of the stuff was, turns out was in the public domain, some of it wasn't. The point was Gilliam never, it never even entered his mind that the law would have anything to do with this, right? It's a collage, it's an animation. He's not, he's not ripping off someone else, he's just putting together a set of things. It's what artists have always done. Ironically, when Gilliam makes his own movie, fictional movie, 12 Monkeys, he includes in the scene of this a chair, a bizarre chair that had appeared in a copyrighted architecture book by the uh, author and architect Levius Woods. Um, the, st the set designer had obviously seen this chair and thought it was really cool. It was a weird chair halfway up a wall. Uh, you, you may or may not have seen it because the, the movie was actually altered. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for the filmmaker, this was a mass market Hollywood production. It's released and at, right at the moment when it's le le released, Lebius Woods and his, his lawyers come and say, that's my copyrighted picture. That's my chair. I have a copyright over that chair and you can't use it. And as a result, what happens is every studio goes, wait, there's an injunction and we have to pull this movie right as we're distributing it. Those of you who are in the business know just how painful and expensive this is. So what do they do? Obviously what they do is people are fired, but then they introduce new procedures which says every single bit of every single movie has to be checked for any fragment of potentially copyrighted culture. And because you're going to get fired if you don't clear something, but no one's going to care if you clear stuff that you shouldn't have to clear, they are wildly on the side of too much clearance. So for example, there's wonderful popular folklore among filmmakers and clearance people about what has to be cleared. Some people think you have to clear every logo on every hat of a person passing in the street. This is total nonsense. There's no legal system anywhere in the world in which such a claim is actually the law. You know, FedEx trucks, oh, we better redact that. You know, I mean, just ludicrous stuff. It's sort of like you know, what kids uh, tell each other in the playground when they're 10 about what sex is all about. You, know, you can't get pregnant if you're standing up, but, but it's the belly buttons. Don't rub the belly buttons. You know, it's just sort of just this bizarre mixture of fact and fiction, which ends up being uh, profoundly misguided. So um, what we've got then is a pattern of legalization of the uses of tiny fragments of culture. In the um, Eyes on the Prize example, they used hundreds of tiny segments of um, newsreel photos, movies and films of the time, the music of the time, which of course reflected very much what was going on. And most of those, in my view, were fair use. Not all of them. If you have a song playing for the entire uh, length of the song, but if you have a snatch of I, We Shall Overcome or a snatch of a Dylan song in the background, certainly if you have a snatch of a news program, that should be covered by fair use and is in the UK and the US, fair dealing in the UK and in the US. But when they made it, they decided to clear everything, which I think was a huge mistake. And then they said to the foundations, oh, you need to give us more money so we can get longer clearances. And the, so the solution is pay more money for longer clearances. Of course, this is like trying to put out a fire by throwing gasoline on it. If the idea is we'll solve the problem by throwing more money at it, then you're simply going to encourage more of these kinds of ludicrous demands, right? That may solve it for eyes on the prize, but it certainly doesn't solve it for the rest of us. So that's a case of either deliberate or accidental incorporation of material in a documentary record. But what we're talking about here is something larger. It has to do with the function of criticism and commentary. We all reflect critically, we hope, on our culture. We talk about it, we criticize it, we annotate it, we produce mashups of it. And some of that commentary it actually counts as criticism, and some of it is directed towards pieces of our culture that are covered by copyright. 
Jennifer was a lawyer in a case like that, not a film case specifically, a case involving a book. Gone with the Wind is the, most, the largest selling book in the history of the world with the exception of the Bible. And as Jennifer will tell you, the estate of Margaret Mitchell, the copyright holder of Gone with the Wind, still holds the copyright, and they're very protective about what gets done with it. And what this story shows is really relevant to documentary film or any other cultural phenomenon, because this case really um, shows two dueling viewpoints um, about what one is and is not allowed to do with fragments of culture. So as James mentioned, second in the sales only to the Bible. Um, how many of you have read the book or seen the movie? This, this tends to be the case, almost, almost, almost unanimous. Um, it's the story of Scarlett O'Hara and the Civil War. And for many, including people outside of the US, people around the world, it's the iconic image of the antebellum period of, in the American South and of slaveholding society. Um, unfortunately, it's also a very romanticized image of a very painful period in American history. And Alice Randall, the writer of The Wind Done Gone, which is a parody and a criticism and a commentary of Gone with the Wind, she wrote her book because she was wondering about things that were missing from Gone with the Wind. In her words, Gone with the Wind is um, a South without miscegenation, without whippings, without families sold apart, without free blacks striving for their education. And she wanted to retell Gone with the Wind in order to criticize it for its highly romanticized depiction of slavery and to ask as a cultural phenomenon how it had come to be so uncritically accepted as to become a global cultural icon. Um, and she was sued by the Mitchell estate for garden variety copyright infringement. They called it piracy of Gone with the Wind. Her publisher contacted us. I was one of the lawyers on the case. And the first thing we asked ourselves is, Gone with the Wind was made in the 1930s. Is it still under copyright? The answer is yes. It was originally, its copyright was originally set to expire in 1992. But as a result of a term extension, we were trying to harmonize our copyright term with the EU. Um, so our term is now author's life plus 70 years. So is yours. Um, the copyright now expires in 2031. So yes. It's still under copyright law. And one of the things we're talking about is um, what, one of the issues that documentarians, any filmmakers, any creators face is that copyright lasts a really long time. And so um, for works created during most of the 20th century, you have to wonder, is it still copyrighted? Is it not? Um, so yes, it's still under copyright. And the evolution of the case really showed two distinct visions of copyright. In the district court, the lower court, the first court we went to, the judge actually banned the book. He said, you can't sell it. You can't advertise it. You can't do anything with it. He said it was unabated piracy. He said it was a parasitical work. So he banned the book, and it went up to the higher court, the appeals court. And they took a very opposite view. They, they overturned the injunction, which is very, they overturned it from the bench, which is very unusual. They said this is a prior restraint of free speech. This violates the First Amendment in the US. And this is an instance of what we call fair use. So their point of view, um, this was a valid criticism and commentary of Gone with the Wind. And it should be protected. This is the kind of thing literature has done for decades. Um, literary works grapple with, evoke, criticize previous literary texts. And if this kind of thing was illegal, you could just wipe the entire canon off of your shelf, right? Fair use is relevant in the documentary context as well. And James is going to talk about some of those cases. So now let's talk about what the, we talked about what the, the fantasy is, the claim that you have to pay for every tiny fragment. Let's talk now about the reality. Now, these are US cases. But I think that most of them would be decided um, similarly in the UK. At least, the, I think the, the, uh, the reasoning would be similar. I don't warrant that. But certainly, the same concepts exist. Um, so if you look at uh, one of the ones here, the, you see the, the, the Peter Graves. Um, uh, this, this movie, should you choose to excerpt it, will self-destruct in 20 seconds. Peter Graves from Mission Impossible um, started off doing um, uh, rather more interesting uh, movies, including um, uh, Invasion of the Saucer Men. Uh, and in a, um, a biography, a documentary of him, um, they used a small fragment uh, of that, uh, I think uh, 20 seconds, less than 1% from that movie to say, you know, this is his early career. 
Um, the court said, absolutely, this is classic fair use. You're referring to it, you're not taking more than is necessary, you're not trying to replace the original. No one's going to watch that instead of Invasion of the Saucer Men. You're referring to it, it's part of your story, it's actually part of his history. Of course it's fair use. Um, and again, this is quite commonsensical, I think. Um, then if you see uh, the next one here, um, this is uh, the TBS uh, documentary of Muhammad uh, Ali. Um, now this is, is interesting, and it, and it may not um, be as attractive to some of the documentarians here. This is a TBS um, biography documentary of, of um, Ali, and it took uh, 9 to 14 clips between 41 seconds and 2 minutes from when, when we were kings. Um, and uh, focusing in the, the rumble and the jungle fight in, in Zaire. And again, the court said, it's a fair use. It's transformative. The purpose of this is different than the purpose of the original uh, documentary. They're using it in a way that isn't just, I'm just going to take your stuff and use it for the same purpose that you did, right? Instead, I'm commenting on it in another way. And this idea of comment has always been at the heart of fair use. And in fact, as you'll see, if you look at the the, the uh, U.S. Uh, the U.K. Copyright Office's uh, clarifications of fair dealing. The same thing can be said, um, although under different terms, um, in the U.K. Um, uh, there were similar ones. I don't know whether or not that was on the uh, the prior page. On uh, we also had there was a, there was another one about aliens and Hollywood. Uh, uh, some uh, and, and again, the court looked at this. They looked at what percentage was taken. They looked at. Um, whether or not they needed that in order to tell their story. They looked at how transformative it was. In the US, they also looked at what effect would this have on the market for the work. And they conclude, oh, there's really no effect here. Now, that doesn't mean that all of this stuff um, is always going to be a fair use. In this uh, example, this was a 16-hour documentary uh, of Elvis's uh, uh, Elvis appearance. Um, and it basically took every great song that every famous song that Elvis had done and it took enormous, uh, enormously large proportions of each song, including what you'd call the hook. That is to say, the key part, there ain't nothing like a hand dog, right? I mean, the, the, the key part of the song, the part that's the, the earworm, the part that you remember. The documentary was um, advertised as all-encompassing. And basically what they did is go around and take every TV show in which Elvis had appeared, every movie in which he did these things, and basically take selections so that they could have this, so that people could effectively have a collection of Elvis music videos. This was different, right? They called it a biography, a documentary, but actually what they weren't doing was wholesale taking of the original thing for the purposes of that thing, i.e., you want to see Elvis, here's Elvis, which was, of course, what the, the first set were, were taking. The court there said, well, this isn't a fair use. Now, you might say, well, that's quite commonsensical, right? And that's actually the key, certainly to US law. UK law is harder to characterize because the UK, the US has a set of four factors and it's sort of broad, sort of philosophical idea of fair use around the concepts I've just described. The UK has a series of very itemized fair dealing exceptions, but they include ones that deal with the issues that I've just been talking about. Incidental uses, fleeting uses, commentary, uh, stuff done for educational purposes and so forth. And it seems to me that you can, you can make a similar case. What's more, there been some UK court cases that make clear, the Ashdown case involving Patty Ashdown is the most marked one, that make clear that the courts will be looking at the Copyright Act and at uses of copyright with an eye to free speech values. So the court's basically going to say, in this case, Ashdown's diary was leaked. I don't know if you remember this. It appeared there. And Ashdown wanted to use copyright to stop the newspaper from printing uh, the excerpts. You can't. It's my copyrighted work. The conclusion of the case is a little complicated. I won't get into it. But the court in saying this say it's quite clear that copyright is not supposed to stand in the way of free expression. So if we actually have someone, if you need those words to make your point, then we're not going to step in and say, you can't tell this story because there's a copyright over it. Freedom of speech, in this case, trumps copyright. And that type of reasoning, even if you're not explicitly appealing to the European Convention on Human Rights, um, or in the case of the US, to the First Amendment. That way of thinking is something that should a case go to court, um, I think judges, uh, at least some judges, would be receptive to, as they were in the example that um, Jennifer was talking about. So all of these seem like this sounds great, right? You're being told that basically this sounds like the golden rule, right? Do unto others, right? This is, seems relatively sensible, seems focused on the kinds of goals you want, gives protection to artists and filmmakers without stifling future filmmakers. So what's the problem, right? The law actually isn't really the problem. The problem is, as all of you know, 
that you don't deal with these matters through going to court. You deal with these matters by going to try and get errors and emissions insurance, if, at least if you want to distribute um, commercially or even actually perhaps at a documentary film festival. And the practice in errors and emissions insurance is very different from the actual law that they purport to apply. The insurance industry is relatively concentrated, became increasingly concentrated after 9-11, and will probably be even more concentrated after the current global financial holocaust. Not that much competition. Um, the patterns of insurance are built largely around commercial films, which are big budget. They can afford to license every clip, even though there's no way that they actually should. And those rules then get applied to documentary filmmakers whose financial realities are very different and whose needs are very different. I mean, if I want to put Madonna, a Madonna song in my big budget Hollywood movie, I should have to pay for it. If you're filming someone who's singing a Madonna song and that's important to the story you're telling, you shouldn't, right? Those are very distinct uses, but is an errors and emissions insurance agent incentivized to care? No. So this is the problem. What we have is a permissions culture in which all of you have been told, I'm sure, you have to pay for it, you have to pay for it, you have to pay for it not true legally speaking. And then you have a risk averse insurance industry where it's, it's, you know, the old saying in the tech world was you never get fired for buying IBM. You never get fired for saying, I think you should clear it. No matter how stupid, how li legally r ridiculous the claim is. So what's, you know, later we'll talk about some solutions, um, but that's the beginning um, of the problem we're, gonna dis uh, we're having. And as Jennifer will describe, uh, the problem uh, has unfortunate ways of, of, of spinning out, of self-perpetuating itself. Imagine our delight, by the way, when we looked at the documentary film cases and discovered they involved either aliens, Muhammad Ali, or Elvis. <laughs> if you're trying to do a comic book, this is a beautiful thing. Um, so as James described, um, our, our modest reformist goal is to actually recalibrate the rules you have to deal with to reflect what the law actually says. Not that nonsensical. Um, short uses for commentary, right? Uh, fair use. Long rip-off parasitical uses, simply putting out the Elvis clips. No, come get your clips here. Not fair use. The law is not so illogical. So if this is not what the law says, and artists as a whole are generally not benefiting from these permissions practices, do you think the person who wrote the Rocky theme song actually saw any of that $2,500? No. Is, that 25, is, is the prospect of getting paid if your song ends up in a ringtone in the background of the documentary gonna, <laughs> going to incentivize you to get out of bed in the morning and write a song, right? No. And so the artists are not actually benefiting from this. The author of the Rocky theme song isn't benefiting. Um, certainly the filmmakers of Mad Hot Ballroom aren't benefiting from having to pay for it. So if this isn't the law and no one's really benefiting from it, what's going on? One thing is what James just described, um, this shadow system of B&O insurance, insurance companies being understandably risk adverse, They're, they form sort of a gatekeeper function, requiring documentary filmmakers to fill out the visual cue sheet and clear everything before it actually goes into uh, commercial circulation, um, major broadcasting channels. But another thing is this clearance culture we're talking about, the vicious circle we tried to represent there um, at the top left. that. If you have to pay for everything, it's logical that you're going to turn around and expect payment when your stuff is used, right? It's just something, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. It's what we call this permissions arm race. And so that's another cultural, just practical aspect that seems to be perpetuating these practices. When, if the rules were recalibrated to reflect what the law actually says, everybody might be better off. If someone wants to take your song, put it in the background, you know, the whole Madonna clip. If someone wants to take parts of your documentary, wholesale and use them for the same purpose, yes, you should be paid. Um, but if it's a fair use, then you don't expect payment. So that's another, that's another um, reason that we feel these things are happening. So um, one more lovely story about this. Um, we actually had uh, a, uh, we're what talking to, to, to Penny Baker, uh, DA Penny Baker and Chris Hegedus uh, outside, and they were telling us of their, they're making the new film that they made the classic, the war room, uh, recounting the Clinton, uh, the Clinton presidential race, and they're making a new one. And they wanted to use a clip which involved Anderson Cooper on CNN playing a clip of the war room and talking about it. Their right? own film, yeah. At, for which they weren't, you know, paid. So what happens? They are told, oh, no, no, you actually have to clear this. 
I, I just think this is this is just absurd, um, and 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 it's it, it's a mark of how far we've we've diverged. So. Um, what I'm describing here, as you know if you're a documentary filmmaker, is a pain. Uh, it's something that gets in the way of your creativity. It actually stops you from telling certain stories in certain ways. Um, it's something you work around. And as I know from having talked to documentary filmmakers, you have no conscience when you have to make a decision which will get your film out. You'll agree to anything. You sign away your children, put it on your credit card. I mean, I feel your pain. It's a form of, of addictive behavior, and I am, a, uh, uh, as a lover of documentary film, I'm very grateful that you feel, feel that way. But as a result, I can't, you know, we can't trust on each of us to make the right decision at the moment. Should I license? Should I not license? It's like, if I pay this, they'll screen my film. If not, they won't screen my film. I'll pay. Right? It's, sort of, it's, a, it's also, also a form of hostage. But what's going on goes beyond documentary film in a way that I don't think we fully understood yet. We now have the technology to have everyone who's wired in the world see that movie, even if we're not as in a nicer format as in a, a theater or in a DVD. That is an amazing future for our culture, not just for documentary film, for culture in general. If we take this set of rules, which doesn't even work well for commercially distributed documentary film, an attempt to apply it to this new digital creativity, to the kid with a camcorder, it's going to be a train wreck. It's going to be a high-speed train wreck because you have laws which were built for vertically integrated corporations distributing, or basically it was a set of contracts about how I should deal with content so that I can deal with the scriptwriter and I can deal with the person with the transmission tower and I can deal with the publisher. And you're now applying it to people who just want to make stuff and put it up. And that is really not going to work because the law did not used to apply to human beings. Copyright law didn't really apply to human beings. What do you mean? Well, this is what I mean. Imagine I hand you a book in 1950 and I say, quick, violate copyright. Uh, admittedly, this is a, a hypo that would only occur to someone in my line of work. But, but bear with me. Quick, violate copyright. Or I hand you an LP. That would, that's like a CD, but, but larger. <laughs> I hand you an LP, and I say, quick, violate copyright. It's 1950. What are you going to do? Uh, um, a, a mimeograph, a cyclo-style machine. I, I think I have a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that I could try to. It's basically impossible. The acts that trigger copyright were set up to be acts that only competitors in the industry could engage in. Copying, reproduction, reprinting, distribution, transmission, performance. Those are the things that copyright regulated. And that was stuff that we were all just like scurrying around down here. I couldn't copy. I couldn't. I didn't have a TV tower. I didn't have a printing press. Right? I couldn't do any of those things. So copyright law applied to me in the sense that, you know, if I wrote something, it was copyrighted. And if I had a printing press, it covered me. But in practice, I just wasn't encountering it on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, imagine a day in which you don't create copies of things, in which you don't version things, in which you don't transmit things, in which you don't create these transitory, ephemeral copies in your browser's cache or uh, in, in, in something that you're working on. Suddenly, rules that were designed to be like anti-tank mines, they could only be set off by horizontal competitors, right? Another publisher could certainly violate my copyright. By, and a pirate could, who was doing it on a large scale, but not human beings. They're now applying to human beings. And so this problem goes beyond just trying to reform errors and emissions insurance practices or to educate documentary filmmakers, because we actually have to rebake the rules not just for you, but for the future of culture. We have to try and acknowledge that the kid who is making a mashup and putting it up on YouTube is not the same as the person who's producing a Hollywood movie, right? They are in different positions, and we need to think about how the rules apply to them. So um, what can we do about this? Um, we have a bunch of solutions. Um, one solution which is, was being suggested and, and actually carried out in the US is to have best practices. So for example, in the US, What's the full name of it, do you remember? The best practices? The statement so of best practices. The statement of best practices um, uh, in documentary film says from filmmakers, this is what we consider unacceptable usage. Right? And that's actually um, a really useful guide because that says if you take from me when you're doing this, or if I take from you, this ought to be OK. And that's not just aimed at the other uh, potential uh, users. It's aimed at the insurers. 
right, so that we can say, look, this is the kind of stuff that really ought to be OK. Fleeting uses shouldn't be covered, et cetera. A second thing is to try and put more pressure on the insurers to basically, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. Let's put um, focus on what are you doing and why are you doing it this way? And let's focus on the rules specifically for documentary film. A third thing, education. Education to filmmakers. And uh, maybe Jennifer can talk a little bit about how that works out. So um, in the statement of best practices, if you Google statement best practices documentary film, it should be the first thing that comes up. It's a really good project that was done at American University in Washington, DC, um, sort of setting community norms. We as documentary filmmakers feel like this is what should and should not be uh, legitimate lawful use. And as James mentioned, another thing is education. Uh, as he mentioned, now copyright law is something that affects everyone deeply, and it affects people without a team of lawyers to advise them, right? And um, there is a lot of misinformation and a lot of rumors. James described it as 10-year-olds talking about sex. But there's, there are a lot of rumors out there. There are a lot of things that are actually wrong. For example, the idea that every logo that appears, I had a documentary filmmaker who read our book um, email me and said, yeah, we were really worried about the logos, the logos on dry cleaner hangers that were in the background of the dorm rooms that were appearing in our documentary. And no, you don't have to worry about clearing that. So there are a lot of rumors, a lot of misinformation out there. And one of the most useful things we thought we could do, this is the, the unholy garden of, of copyright delights we were trying to show, you know, the, 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 the treacherous landscape of, of any filmmaker trying to navigate um, the landmines without uh, the, the assistance of copyright lawyers. We thought one of the things that we could do is try to clear up some of this misinformation, try to offer a more balanced account of what copyright law actually says. Try to provide filmmakers, the public, the entire artistic community with better information. And again, as James said, no one seems to want to read our law review articles. We could have put this in a 100-page footnoted tome, but instead we thought, well, you know, let's, let's offer it in a format that's actually maybe possibly enjoyable to read, but actually provides the information that you need. And so we wrote this comic book. Um, it's about documentary film, it's about copyright, it's about fair use, it's about the public domain. It's available free online in a number of formats. You can download the whole thing. If you Google, again, that's the easier way. If you Google bound by law comic, it should be the first thing that comes up. It'll take you to our web page and you can download it and you can remix it, you can play with it, you can do all sorts of things with it. So we welcome you to go to our web page and download the comic book. But um, so this is one of the other things that we're trying to do is education to try and counter the miseducation. And one reason, at least in the US jurisdiction elsewhere, that this education is really important is um, fair use can actually be contracted. It's a living doctrine. Um, under the US, we look at the market, whether, whether you're interrupting a market for the copyrighted work. Well, if everyone's paying $10,000 for six second ringtones, you created a market where there wasn't one before, which actually takes those uses out of the fair use pool. And so fair use is like an arm. You know, if you don't use it, or something atrophies, you live, it might just fall off. Hence, use it or lose it. And so through education, we're not only trying to clear up the, to debunk the myths and clear up the rumors about copyright law, we're actually trying to make sure that people assert their fair use rights so that the zone of freedom continues to be as robust as it is, because it can actually contract. Um, and again, Google Bound by Law comic if you would like to read more about that.